My name is Kirsten Wellnitz and I'm the Managing Librarian at Sage Library and on behalf of the Bay County Library System I would like to welcome you to Booked for Lunch today. Um, a reminder that next week is the last presentation for this Booked for Lunch session. It will be Margaret Bird and she will be reviewing All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. And if you haven't already, please help yourself to a cookie or some beverages over there that are provided by the Friends of the Bay County Library System. Um, just a quick announcement for some programs that we have coming up. All four branches of the Bay County Library System will be having Studio 23 present classes to adults in the months of November and December. So you can check out the November, December newsletter online right now and it should be in the branches shortly um, to see the dates and times. The first session that we have coming up will be at SAGE on Wednesday, November 4th at 3.30 in the afternoon and it will be a canvas collage. So we're kind of excited about that. So if you're curious in what Studio 23 has to offer, you can check it out for free at the library. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ron Bloomfield. Ron has been with the Bay County Historical Society since 1993, many of those years as the curator of collections and research, for the past seven years serving as the director of operations and chief historian. He holds a bachelor's degree from Central Michigan University with dual majors in history and English and a museum studies concentration. Ron's leadership roles include many regional and statewide professional preservation and civic organizations, including um, the past president of the Michigan Museums Association and the president of the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History. Ron is also past president and current board member of the Michigan Underwater Preserve Council, a member of the Michigan Heritage Leadership Council, and was appointed by Governor Granholm in 2010 to serve on the state of Michigan's Underwater Salvage and Preserve Advisory Committee. A member of the Bay City Noon Rotary Club, Ron served as president during the 2014-2015 club's centennial year. He has also been involved with many community-based projects, including the Rotary Micropark Kiosk Program, River of Time Committee member, and as a consultant on numerous local history-based documentaries. Ron has widely researched and lectured on local history, shipwreck preservation, historic resource management, historic preservation, and collections care, and has also published several books on local history, including Maritime Bay County in 2009 and Legendary Locals of Bay City in 2012. Ron was also the executive producer of the 2012 documentary Sunken Treasure, Preserving Michigan's Shipwrecks, a grant-funded documentary promoting proper stewardship of our state's underwater resources. Today, he will be talking about his third book, Lost Bay City, which was, which was released in July of this year. So please help me in welcoming Ron Bloomfield. Mankind's fascination with those things that have been lost goes back thousands of years. And that quest to solve the, these mysteries have driven some people even to the brink of madness. Think of the lost city of Atlantis, uh, lost cities of gold, the tombs of the pharaohs, the lost colony of Roanoke and the treasure of Oak Island, the Titanic, lost and found, and even our own Great Lakes equivalent, the, the Griffin, which is still missing. This fascination has been sensationalized by Hollywood. <laughs> Many movies have produced, been produced around this theme, but the biggest franchise has to be that of my, one of my boyhood heroes, Indiana Jones. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark was the tipping point that made me want to be an archaeologist, even as a high school student. That is, until I learned how much or how little I could hope to make it this profession. So I went into museums, go figure. I'm sorry, that, that was an inside museum joke. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I would not have also not have had the patience. Um, Dr. Jones never had to trowel and brush a one foot square plot of dirt for hours on end to extract some fish bones. At least not in the movie version. For Dr. Jones, X almost never marked the spot until it actually did. And he wasn't doing his job unless someone was trying to double cross him, steal, the object of his hunt or kill him. In Bay City, 
We recently had several of our own lost finds. A time capsule was recently unearthed, soggy contents and all. Road projects have given us bits of trolley tracks and road bricks, and I'm told parts of sewers even recently. And uh, remnants of our, those are all, a lot of those remnants of our past transportation systems and our infrastructure, all lost underground. And a mural from the mid-1970s was revealed on the back of the Dunlop building. Here it is, as it was recently found. Here it is in black and white from 19, probably 1976, 77, somewhere in there. At least the cars tell us that. Shortly after it was painted. This brings me to the reason I invoked the name of my boy, boyhood Hollywood created idol, Dr. Jones. He had a famous line, that belongs in a museum. He was always fighting to find something and preserve it for the public good. Not unlike we who work in the museums and historical societies, like the Bay County Historical Society, or not unlike what we do uh, on a daily basis. We collect, we preserve, and we educate. It is ironic that Dr. Jones's biggest find, the Ark, ended up in obscurity in a government warehouse until movie number four. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen The Crystal Skull, where it makes a brief appearance again. As a museum, we have a warehouse. In essence, in essence, it's a warehouse. With a collection of a quarter of a million objects and archives and a small physical plant, it is very hard to find enough storage room, let alone enough exhibit space to exhibit any more than, at the most, 1% of what we have at any given time. So in an effort to not let all of our artifacts be simply preserved in the collection, although preservation is our number one mission, uh, by the way. However, we use the aforementioned exhibits, the research archives, online content, documentaries, and books like Lost Bay City to help us bring these objects, these photographs, and these archival, this archival material to the public. Lost Bay City joins two others, Maritime Bay City in 2009 and uh, Legendary Locals in 2012. All three are Arcadia publications, all three similar in, in, uh, in size, similar in content scope, similar in format. Um, and you'll see a little bit of that today as we go through some of these. They actually, these books all put together complement each other. And that's kind of one of the things that sort of appeared afterwards, but it was in essence by design. Um, at least I'll say it's by design. So it, so it makes it look like it was done that way. So let's take a quick journey through Lost Bay City. I'll give you some technical aspects on the book for starters. 127 pages, 223 photographs, eight chapters that weave through storylines. This one was unique in that it was sort of a dealer's choice of topics. I let the photographs drive the book. If you don't see a topic or an image, one may not have been available or at my disposal to actually legally use, or it may have been one that was unfortunately cut due to length. I considered over a thousand images to start with, and I only had to borrow a few for some really needed topics like the, the slide you saw of the mural up front. B-E-A-U-X, arts, style uh, building, buff sandstone uh, trim, two port chairs. Many of you probably, if you ever went to the Winona, remember the port chairs. The lobby floor, floor was ceramic tile inlaid with patterns reflecting the painted ceiling. There was the Princess Winona, which now resides at the museum in the elevator lobby. That was a memorable part. I've talked to many former bellhops that used to stand near, the, near or on top of the princess while they were um, waiting for bags to come in and they were waiting for clients to come in and they, they remembered her with a lot of affection. Uh, the remainder, let me see, elevators and the stairs rose the second floor rotunda where all there were several small parlors. Remainder of the second and third floor were all guest rooms. We also have some pictures of guest rooms up in the upper corner here as you see. Modern in, in all amenities at the time, um, for the time obviously. We, uh, we can look at, view the entryway, the, the actual check-in desk, as you would. Um, down, uh, this photograph from, that was taken about 1943. Um, departure time is noted at 5 p.m., which is actually pretty liberal nowadays. Uh, at the far left is the R of the neon bar sign that was there. And at the right is the cashier sta station, and that was enclosed and separate from the public. Very interesting. It was marble wainscoted, and if you come to the historical museum, you see, copy, see some of those marble tiles that have been preserved. 
Here we see more pictures of the interior of the Winona and its grandeur, the, uh, the lobby. We see a, a picture taken from the rotunda down in the other, the lower, uh, your lower right hand corner. And we see the Winona being built. Remember, we're moving backwards in time. As you can see, it's only got a couple of cores already put up, and uh, the, the, the trademark um, W, I guess, icon, I guess you call it a W icon on top of the window. And then, um, you know, obviously it's either winter or it has rained because there's lots of water sitting around. But they were in the process of building this particular building because of an earlier fire that happened with the Fraser House. That building had stood on that site since 1865 when James Frazier <coughs> had it built but never got to actually see it. He died shortly before it was opened. Uh, so he never got to see it fully opened. That's what they called it, the Frazier House. And that served the same purpose as the, uh, the same purpose in town. It was the grand dame, so to speak, of the Bay City Hotels. That was the place everybody wanted to go. Had a retail space in the, in the downstairs. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it was, um, it was also, it had a ballroom and um, multiple meeting spaces and, of course, guest rooms. But that was an 1860s era hotel, which lasted until 1906, December, same time of the year as the Winona Hotel fire. And that uh, fire started in an annex and actually engulfed the building. So the, the site doesn't have very good track record when you think of how many fires have been there. There was also... In the time before photography, there was a grocery store on that site as well, prior to the Fraser House, and uh, that was reported to have burned as well. So um, they were very, uh, very good to build the planetarium out of, out of uh, glass and, and um, metal material. <laughs> now, I spent a whole chapter on the Winona Hotel just because of the significance. There's more photographs than what I'm showing here. but. Um, more of that particular site has a lot of significance. And that's, in the book, we actually go forward, we, we start at the beginning and we work our way forward. But like the archeologists did, I wanted to show you what, how we would unearth a particular site nowadays. Now back to the, the beginning, um, we'll go back to the beginning. This is chapter one, it's called The Changing Community. And it basically it deals with streetscapes. This is Midland Avenue. Um, this is a Thomas Webster photograph. And, and Webster, you'll, I'll get to Webster in a minute. But this is the 800, 800 block of Midland between North Walnut and Litchfield. Around 1883, it was taken looking east. And uh, you don't see some of these features very often. You anyway, don't see them at all uh, anymore. Things like um, the salt derricks that are in the, on the side of the photograph. Is that, is that clipping the photo? I don't know. Yeah, I guess you can actually see them. They're behind here. There's some. Uh, salt derricks from the lumber mill that would have been over on this side. And of course at that time the whole uh, west side was ringed with lumber mills as was the east side. But Joe Perro's, Perro's Barbershop at 805 East Midland, the Hayes Brothers Saloon at 807 East Midland, Dominic Frenker's Saloon at 811 East Midland, and Alexander Photographer, if you look real closely, Alexander Photographer at 815 East Midland Street. Looks a lot different nowadays, doesn't it? They're an adjacent part of a lumber mill. Typically, they would pull the brine up, and then they would use the slag lumber. That would be the pumping area. They would pull it up, and they would use the slap, slag lumber that they had or the sawdust, and they'd burn it, and they would extract. The water would go away, and what would be left with is salt. And that was a big commodity back then, because you packed all of your, uh, you didn't have refrigeration, unless you could get ice, and that was few and far between, uh, especially in the summer. So they would salt things like fish and a lot of other goods would be salted, and that's how you stored a lot of it. So salt was a big commodity, and we were a big producer of salt. If you think of Dow and the brine that happened in Midland, it's all kind of related to the same, same uh, I guess, under, underground. You know, a lot of the whole area had a lot of that, the stores of salt. Um, that was the easiest way to do it, and it was cheap, because you were going to throw the slag lumber and the sawdust away. Why not burn it and, and pull something else up that you could use for another commodity. Now looking at streetscapes, here we look at another famous streetscape. Can anybody tell me what this church is? First Baptist. That is one that becomes extremely significant because most photographs you, that are taken of the east side, you can pinpoint where you're at by the spire, even sometimes just this little part 
of that particular steeple. That church was built, this was taken on July 4th, 1877. This is another Thomas Webster photograph. And this is actually looking down, you know, this would be looking east down center. And um, I don't know how the contrast is for you. It's a little better on my screen here. But uh, you see the parade. You can also see tracks running down through there as well and some of the buildings. Now that, all the trees, that's the thing that struck me is all the trees that are there. And that has, that has significantly changed. This is off of a glass plate negative. You see the crack up in the, or the bubble up in the corner here. But um, the First Baptist Church gave ways year, years ago to a parking lot on the southeast corner of Madison and Center Avenue. This is Thomas Webster. He's actually featured in Legendary Locals. He, was, uh, um, he lived from 1848 to, 18, 1848 to 1940. He was a lawyer who came to Bay City in 1874, and then he became a probate judge in 1881. He was also an amateur photographer, and we have a lot of photographs from him on glass plate negatives that have come back to the society over the years. And it's a great uh, representation of Bay City during that year because he was one of the only ones that thought to go outside of the portrait studio and actually take shots of the city at large. And his collections show a lot of different things, including this. This was the, the picture that he took of the original um, post office building uh, that, where the federal building now sits. This was the one prior to that. That was built in 1893 at the north end of Washington between 3rd and 2nd Streets. And he took this picture, and then there's another one in the collection as well, but uh, showing it under construction. Of course, this is how the building looked afterwards. And the interesting part, I talk about streetscapes. There are many people that look down and say, oh, that's City Hall. <coughs> well, the tower's a little shorter. You usually can't tell that in photographs. But one is at one end, and one's at the other end of Washington Avenue. So sometimes photos get misidentified because of the, just because of the tower. But you have to look at some of the other. I mean, this tower is drastically different than City Hall's. But... Sometimes people just see a tower and think City Hall is the only one that has a tower now. So, um, and it's a common, it's actually happened quite a few times that it's been misidentified. Now, it's gen this building it generally was referred to as the post office uh, due to its, that was its most visible function, but they've had federal courts and everything in that building ever since it opened. This is the First Baptist Church. This was it taken, you know, much later, 1950s. And it was um, actually closer to the 1960s. But as you'll notice, there was probably a lot of outlot around this prior uh, to this when the building was originally built. And you remember all the trees, all the trees are gone. A lot of them are gone now. But you see how the road is widened. And it's, it's actually quite a bit wider. And it is encroached and encroached and encroached. So when they tore it down, the parking lot, you'd look at that parking lot and go, boy, I don't see how a church could have stood there. But you have to remember that it was actually um, sandwiched in there uh, with two, you know, the, the two roads that would have only been two tracks initially. And so they, as they widened the streets and put the improvements in, it's drastically cut down even on, the, on the, the site. Same thing with the Masonic Temple. It's right on the sidewalk. It wouldn't have been right on the sidewalk necessarily. There would have been some green space. Um, you can kind of see it in this picture a little bit. I'll show another one in a minute, which actually this one. This is the Masonic Temple originally. There's the First Baptist Church. That's the Masonic Temple here under construction. You say, no, nah, it doesn't look anything like it did. Um, what's with the tower and the, all of this? Well, the uh, Masonic Temple was the Pratt and Copey designed this building, same people that designed um, several churches and uh, City Hall and the museum building, believe it or not. Um, they, they were uh, building, building buildings in the town. They're kind of one of the famous noted architect firms. This was designed in a palatial building that could house several lodge rooms and space for Masonic ceremonies. Cornerstone was a, of the building. It was a, a Moorish inspired building, but the cornerstone was laid uh, June 24th, 1891, and it was completed February 27th of 1893. Uh, it's at the corner of 6th and Madison, where the, the one that's there sits. It's the same building. Um, but it was heralded as one of the most handsome Masonic buildings in the country at that time. Unfortunately, it had a fire as you see up on the top, May 19th of 1903. And that looks like a pretty big conflagration. There's the $50 word for the day. <laughs> conflagration, conflagration. Uh, it, um, it gutted the building, it heavily damaged the roof line, but they were able to rebuild it. And they, um, the building you see down here, there's a, still an onion dome left and the tower's left. 
and actually I think there's two onion domes that survived or that were at least rebuilt. Uh, it wasn't rebuilt to the grandeur that it had been and those features were eventually removed to the building as you see it now today and it still I think, believe still has some roof issues now even after they removed the after the uh, onion domes were removed and all of the other ornamentation on the top. But the building itself um, in the 1960s, the Tower of the Onion Domes and all the other ornamentation have pretty much been removed from it. And it, it is now, obviously, it's being used for different purposes, but the building itself retains a lot of the character that it had um, on the inside. A lot of the lodge rooms were untouched, I mean, to the point where the, thread, the carpeting and the furnishings were threadbare. Here's another streetscape, switching time periods and everything else. How many people remember, remember this, looking at this? Yes. Euclid Avenue looking north. The, uh, of course, we just saw a distinctive one. As I was writing the book, they took the Texan down, and that was one that should have been in the book, um, but they, it was too new. I was already done with the, with the manuscript. But there's, yeah, still working on the roads. <laughs> there, that's true. <laughs> but this is now, now this is that four lane that divides Bay City's western boundary, and, and it's, um, it's seen many changes. Um, and uh, it was, you know, the Texan obviously is the latest thing to have been raised, but uh, Richie's Drive-In, which is pictured here, how many people went to Richie's? I'm sure there's a, more than a few, yep. Uh, that was uh, a landmark, when that's where Discount Tire now stands, in that roughly in that area. And then, of course, there's other, other things in this, this area, but it's, uh, it's definitely changed a lot since then. Here's, here's another one, too. This is on the other side of the river. Our double tree now stands here, but this was called the, uh, this was the, actually, this was taken in the mid-60s. This was the Imperial 400. I think we knew it as the, the Gateway Regency once upon a time. Uh, it was removed in the 1990s to make way for the current double tree. And there's an automobile, autom oops, sorry, automobile dealership back in here, which I'll get to in a little while. Um, and then, of course, the Winona Hotel eventually disappeared, and that changed the entire streetscape right there. So if you want to talk about a very different streetscape, it's very interesting to look at these snapshots in time. And here's another one that would have been just out our door, our front, the library's front door here. If you'd have looked across at the, where the county building sits, this is what you would have seen originally. This is the original county building built in 1867. Second Empire Building built by Cyrus Watkins, and it was on the north side of center between, between Jefferson and Madison. And um, Keith, what is that area out there called? Battery Park. Battery Park. <laughs> which they're now working on. That's people have kind of, that's been resurrected as of late. And uh, that was designated as Battery Park, as, and then the buildings built around it. Um, and that was supposed to be kind of the center of town, the center of where everything happened, because on the other side, well, the, here, here's the existing county building. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the existing county building, what it looked like when it was being built. You know, typical, uh, that was built in the 30s after the other one was torn down um, because it was, it was really in bad shape. It didn't um, catch on fire. No, that one didn't <laughs> catch on fire. But it was, it was yeah. I think that's why they said, um, because it actually was designed for practical ventilation and everything was supposed to work right, but apparently it didn't work well. It was already started to get, um, it was old, I guess is what I read by the time. But this Art Deco skyscraper that we ha now have of nine stories was built in 1934 at the height of, the, or in the Depression, and it was actually a, a, um, one of those government, built by one of those government pro uh, programs designed by uh, Joseph Gadeen, who was local. And the uh, Historical Society, my employer, had a suite of rooms. How many people remember going to the museum on the second floor? Yeah, there's a few. There's still a few that remember that. Yeah, we were uh, we were in that, and that was that was when they tried to put everything on exhibit. But of course, our collection was much much smaller back then too, um, and that was basically designed in that suite suite of rooms was designed as a museum from day one, and uh, they then decided in the 1960s that they needed some more space for the courts, and they said, yeah, you probably ought to move out. So we found the house on Center Avenue that we were in at 1700 for a while, and then of course now we're at the, the old armory building, which is much bigger and much better space, although I'll tell you a secret, we're out of space. <laughs> there are a quarter of a million artifacts and objects, plus all the exhibits and every, everything takes up a lot of room. But 
as I was starting to say about this sort of being that center of town, this building would have been located um, to the, where I think just the extreme end of the Wirt Library building, um, where the old, uh, you would have known the jail that sat there, a lot of you would have seen it. Um, that was uh, more of a sort of a squat brick structure that was built in the 1940s, I believe. Um, this was the original jail. And it was, it looked north on count, and of course, you know, you've got a nice fountain here. This is part of the Battery Park. Because this looked north, this looked north. This included the sheriff's residence. It had a parlor, a dining room, a pantry, and an upstairs bedrooms. The actual jail was located in a two-story wing at the back, and it had a separate entry off of Jefferson Avenue. It featured 16 five by seven foot cells with iron bars, floors, ceilings, and floors and ceilings that were made of boilerplate. Now, the female inmates had a separate accommodations on the floor above the sheriff's quarters. Here's just to give you a little more perspective. This is essentially Battery Park. In this, you're, you're looking kind of in the middle of it. But here's the, uh, well, actually, it would be more over here. I'm sorry. This is the jail. You're looking at it more across the street from that original county building. But this is the Redato, which I'll get to later. And this is First Baptist Church right here. So here we're seeing it, and there is right here a cannon, one of those mortars that were uh, part of the four mortars that were on the corners of Battery Park. A better picture of it right here. This is the opposite side of the road. Here's the Pier Marquette Depot. You're looking down Jefferson here. This is the old Bay City Club, <coughs> which became Shopnagon Grotto later. And then the, uh, you can see the corner of the old county building right here. And there were, of course, this is one of the, the Hartford guns right here. Not the other one on the other side was one of the Civil War era mortars. But this is the opposite side of, of that four corners that were Battery Park. In uh, 1904, Congressman George Loud of Bay City secured two artillery guns from the USS Hartford, which are these here. Uh, and they were planted, uh, placed in Battery Park. And um, at the center, while the uh, other one was placed at the, this side was put in there and then across was one to the center avenue to the south. And then in 1907, they were joined by two large artillery mortars, Civil War vintage from Fort Sumter, which were acquired by Congressman Loud as well. And they were placed on the other two corners. There was also an artillery gun, which I don't believe we actually know where that came from. There were supposedly two of them placed on the, on the grounds of City Hall. This predates 1910 because our building was built in 1910. And this is certainly the building that was, was there before, the old armory. So um, this looks a lot different as well, but this, was in, this is in the chapter called Monuments, basically, and it talks about the guns that were placed there. We lost all of those guns to the scrap drive in World War II, unfortunately. They were carted on a train, and they were part of Bay City's contribution that they were sent off for the scrap drive. There had also been two over at the stage, stage library. Yep. And I've never seen photographs of those. I've been looking. I've never, never found photographs of the ones at Sage Library. Um, but they were a pretty significant, I mean, this was not uncommon. Other communities did the same thing. So it's pretty rare to have something like that that survived. Um, it's unfortunate, but you know, we did need to, to pump up the arsenal of democracy. And Gonser, Captain Gonser was one of the ones that was on that committee. And he would be considered one of our patrons, patron saint of local uh, veterans in that. So they, they had the full support of everyone who really would have had anything to say about it for that monument committee at the time. So it was, and they did a big th write up in the newspaper and they placed, on the ones at City Hall, they placed two wooden plaques and those were eventually given to the Historical Society. We have those in the collection. But they basically say that these were given to the war effort. Does anyone remember this building? Yeah. Yep, Naval Reserve, U.S. Naval Reserve Training Center. It was a Quonset hut style, dual Quonset huts actually, built for training in 1949 and in 1961, just the information I had was from 1961, it was one of a chain of similar centers stretching across the le length and breadth of America, and I'm quoting here. The purpose of these centers is as a naval reserve to provide a proof, a, a, I'm sorry, provide a pool of trained manpower on which the Navy can call in the time of an emergency. Surface Division 9-74 was organized in 1946 originally, and that's what this was part of. The Navy approached Bay City at that point about erecting a training center on the middle grounds. And this is an interior shot of what that looked like. If you'll notice back on this, these are the Quonset huts here essentially. And you go in, you can see the domed roof of, of the Quonset hut. <coughs> this is the simulation, <coughs> simulated bridge of a, a, a vessel. 
a wartime vessel. They also had things for uh, signaling. They did a lot of uh, their recruit training for a lot of anything that happened in, that would have happened in you know on on board vessel in the Navy. Eventually, the building um, was in 19, the mid 1960s. It, it served until the mid 1960s, and around 1967, it was given to the Boys and Girls Club, which eventually raised it in favor of a new building in the 1975 in the middle grounds. So that gives you some idea of where that sat on the same, same site. Mural City is, was branding initiative started by Downtown Bay City Incorporated in 1976. Our, our mayor at the time was John Willerts. He officially proclaimed the name for this large number of bicentennial murals that were around town. Um, and his proclamation said that by 1977, some 50 murals would make Bay City um, a major tourist destination. They planned on costume tours of the murals, major marketing campaign. It ultimately drew nationwide attention, but some of the stuff really wasn't realized. Now this building was located at, and this is kind of the gateway to Mural City. It's Welcome to Mural City, and it has these, these um, panels up here which show uh, space exploration, justice, a woman uh, with a flag, Paul Revere, and a pioneer with a, a sign proclaiming Welcome to uh, Mural City. And uh, it basically, this building was this building, which was the Sullivan Motor Company, and it was an Oldsmobile dealership. And that distinctive top cap right there kind of sets that building off. And if you look on the previous, it's missing. So this is one of those buildings, but you can still see this detail here, but it's missing the cap. So they've reused that building. The Atlas Furniture Building was the Oldsmobile dealership known as Sullivan Motor Company. There's the that other piece right there, and there's the cap. Now, uh, this was 500 Washington Avenue, and from the mid-1930s through the mid-1940s, it was, um, or that's the time, it was uh, the northeast corner of Washington and McKinley. And then it became Atlas Furniture, and later it was torn down, um, and it's a parking lot now. It was raised, in the 19, raised around uh, 1983. But the murals, a lot of these murals were painted by a guy named Terry Dickerson. Dickinson, I'm sorry, Terry Dickinson. I keep wanting to mispronounce it for some reason. But this is one here that shows a uh, saying by Will Rogers, by land they ain't making no more, sponsored by the Bay County Board of Realtors. This was um, located on the former Eagles Club at 201 Washington Avenue, which I believe the building's not there anymore. Of course, the Valley Oxygen one down here is, um, get my notes here. This was also a Dickinson mural, and it shows uh, Joseph Priestley discovering oxygen in 1774. This was on the, um, the Valley Oxygen uh, building. And then there's a framer down here. This was on the back of the old Shearer building, uh, where Nielsen Galleries originally had located. That's a framer, and it has Nielsen Galleries up in the corner. And the top one is, um, this was the building that was located next to the old Brass Lantern. So it would have been just to the south of the Brass Lantern. And this is, um, let me make sure I got my notes here. This was the, the, fathers at a ta the founding fathers at a tavern, is how it's, uh, <laughs> which is appropriate, being next to the Brass Lantern. Um, but of course, the building was eventually torn down, and the Brass Lantern's become other things since then. This one is, is one that is no longer there, as either is the building. Remember I told you originally about that dealership, that car dealership that was behind the uh, Imperial Motel? Well, Roller Mania swelled to a fever pitch in August of 1977 with a visit from the Bay City Rollers. Scottish rock band's hits included the infectious Saturday Night, S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y. Yeah, that, that one. And now you're going to have that in the, your head for the rest of the day. I apologize. And their name was the result of supposedly a dart throw at a map. Um, that hit Bay City. Bay City Times heralded their visit as the biggest thing since the bridge fell in. <laughs> this mural was painted on the back of that original dealership, which was, became the Bay Metro Transit Authority building on Water Street in honor of their visit. Of course, the building doesn't exist anymore. But the interesting part is I have this picture. This was taken by Stephen Kent, um, who took a bunch of these mural photos at the time. And they're on slides. So they didn't, when I have to for the book, I had to put them in black and white. But if you look at the color, 
I always wondered what this blob was over in the corner. That's actually a globe with a dart in it. <laughs> I just noticed that when I was preparing for this, this talk. It's like, that's what that is. So there's, there it is in color. Now that's as best color as we can get at this point. But that shows that. And that was, I don't believe that one was done by uh, Dickinson. That was done by someone else. And of course, um, Zeter Motor Sales. This was uh, the Dodge Sales. This was uh, located at 621 North Water Street between 6th and 7th. And the uh, Bay City Murals Roller was on the back of this building. This is the building, that, this is the car dealership that I had talked about. And uh, this was basically located where the Double Trees Conference Center part now, now sits. Um, Henry Zeter built the, the dealership in 1949, and he was uh, tires, batteries, greasing and lubrication, genuine Mopar parts, and dealerships for Dodge and Plymouth cars and trucks. Later, he sold it to Reed Draper. It was sold to Reed Draper, and then it eventually became Brahm and Ray, and then it was Mel Smith, Lincoln Mercury for a while in 1970s. And then Bay Metro purchased it in 77 until around 82 when it was torn down. And that built, that mural went away. Uh, we have other businesses in town that have gone away, and things like American Hoist is in, in uh, the, the crane. Here's an early photograph of the crane manufacturer, which was one of the biggest in the world. I'm going to move quick through some of these. This is the old um, Jenison Hardware Company. And this is the original building. This is not the one that stands on the site now that was turned into to the, uh, the tall um, condos, the Jenison Place. This was the original building that had a fire burned down. Uh, there's that whole common theme. Yeah, in March of 1924, and then they built the bigger building. But the interesting part about this is we have a collection of stuff that was given to us. This is the building, but we also have some interiors. This kind of looks like the Putz Hardware, you know, that type of a setup where you've got everything and anything. And here, let me get my note. This, and there's a couple of photographs, but this, um, that show kind of similar views. But you see any, all kinds of things, security bells, brass valves, lanterns. I took a loop and, and really looked hard into these, this photograph. It's amazing the stuff that they were selling. Rubber hose, uh, this sits outside the paint department. They had a early paint sample cabinet that's back there. And um, then there were several photographs showing Kind of some of this stuff there. Well, okay, I guess I didn't go into another one, but this is a, an example. There's others in the book as well. And this was a multi-story operation. Plus, they eventually then had the, uh, the steel warehouse as well. Now, this is the another hardware company. This was Bay City Hardware Company, which was started in 1902 by another uh, mayor, uh, Robert V. Mundy. And uh, this was uh, they sold hardware farm and farm implements. This is 1009 to 1015 Saginaw Street. Anyone know what's there right now? It's a parking lot. Basically now it's a parking lot. They never replaced it after, after the fire. Here you see a better close-up of them actually battling the fire. The fire broke out um, July 12th of 1952. It was massive fire. Lots of people that I've talked to remember going to the, the parents took them to the fire. Apparently that was a big thing to take your kids to, to watch a fire like that. <laughs> Uh, we even found that with the, recently with the Jupiter and some of the stuff coming out with the Jupiter, that was the big thing. You went to watch those disasters for some reason. Oh, okay. Um, but according to sources, a, a total of 110 firefighters worked the scene, including Saginaw and auxiliary, uh, local auxiliary units. Flames shot 100, 100 feet into the sky, and it took two and a half hours to contain the crowd of 4,000. And uh, then after the total loss, the company did move to a new location on Sherman Street and it operated until 1978. Of course, now it's a parking lot. <laughs> this is an homage to the, uh, the, Bay City, the other Bay City Rollers. Of course, this was the earlier Bay City Rollers. Those are stacks of cigars. These are ladies working in the cigar uh, rolling plant. Um, this was the, this is uh, the BR Han, BR Han, H-A-H-N, Cigar Factory, which was located at 2006 to 2008 5th Street around 1924. They have the finished cigars that are ready for packing. Um, there was a, interestingly enough, Ada Fisk, who worked for a rival uh, company called the um, N.W. Fisk and Company, N.J. Fisk and Company, I'm sorry. Uh, she was, her occupation was actually listed as a stripper in 1902 and 03 city directories. Uh, we use that a lot because it's kind of interesting how names of uh, occupations have changed. She actually stripped the leaves. She, that's, that was her occupation, literally. <laughs> stripping the leaves. But 
I'll never forget one of our research librarians found that he went, oh, I found definitive proof that there were strippers in Bay City back in the lumbering era. No, sorry. It's cool, though. <laughs> it's, sorry. <laughs> but uh, the B.R. Hahn Company was only one of uh, two active manufacturing companies left in Bay City in 1948. So we actually had cigar manufacturing all the way up into the 1940s, and one of them, I think, went past that even. Do you have the date of that? This photograph's 1924. Yeah, and that, that fits with the, the style of clothing and everything else. So. And look at, this, look at the boxes that are stacked up over here. It's amazing. It was a big, it was big business for Bay City. This is one of the, uh, this is actually the um, Liber Lewis Liberty, well, we had three of the largest pre-cut housing industries, in any, any, three of the largest pre-cut housing um, companies in Bay City. One of them, the Aladdin Lewis, or Aladdin, and then there was a Lewis Liberty Homes and then Sterling Homes. And they sold, combined, over 200,000 homes, ranging from bungalows to luxury style mansions. They sold them through illustrated catalogs all the way up into the 1970s um, when they started closing down. This is the Mill of International Mill and Timber, which was the last of the three, the Sterling Homes that I mentioned. This was on the west side, south of Salzburg Avenue, uh, right around where Duncan's is. This, is, this was that, the site down there, and this was a huge plant at the time. This would have been during the heyday. And this was taken around 1920. Of course, we have Berenger Greenhouse. This was the earlier of two buildings. When it's flowers, say it with ours. That was their slogan. Started by Albert and Rudolph uh, Berenger in 1893, and it was originally at 325 Park Avenue near Ridge Road, which is that picture. They, had, they grew to over 20 acres with 13 greenhouses, 50,000 square feet under glass, and two miles of steam pipe. They were noted as one of the, the leaders in the business. Um, and uh, near, let me see, they, they were called the splendid establishment from their hothouses. They supply more flowers than any other single establishment in northern Michigan. And that was in uh, 19, 1915. They were quoted in one of the, the histories of Michigan. We move on to grocery stores, Ray's Food Fair. Anyone remember Ray's Food Fair? Mold, they had multiple uh, stores, but this, uh, these were the start of those big box chain grocery stores. Their first store was on Washington Avenue in 1949, and they went and had stores on West Midland in 1956, uh, Center Avenue. This is the 20, this 2616 Center Avenue, so just out at the Essexville border. Um, taken in 1957. That's what this, this was the grand opening. They also had one on Salzburg Avenue and another one on Euclid Avenue. This was the last one to close and a family dollar store is now located here. But interestingly enough, when we blew the photo, I don't know if you can see it up, but we blew it up. There is an interesting icon over in this corner. You can see it better in the book. I see it best, better in my screen. There's a little Uncle Sam looking type hat. There was a Liberty store apparently over there, and we caught the corner, the photographer caught the corner of their marquee as they were taking pictures. And somebody I talked to said, oh yeah, I remember the Liberty store. So I thought that was real interesting that you get two for one in that photograph. And Kroger, we now know Kroger as a big, the big box stores that um, you know, were at the one, especially the one on Euclid Avenue. But they were a simple grocer. They had their roots in the community that were all the way back to the 1920s. This was pictured, this one here is located at 520 Center Avenue, it was around 1955. But they had one at Broadway, they had one on North Henry, they had one on North Jackson and South Madison. And of course they combined all those stores into the Euclid Avenue and the other one on Center, on Center Road in Essexville. And the, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. A and P started in Pennsylvania. Eight stores were opened in Bay City in 1938 at locations on Center Avenue, Johnson, Columbus, Midland, and State Streets. And by 1955, they consolidated into one supermarket location, as they called it, at 501 Fifth Street. And that's where this one is. This is 501 Fifth Street. Um, this was about 1957. In 1971, they opened a store at 2750 Center Avenue, which eventually was closed um, around 1979. And um, the train <laughs> hmm? yep, there's the train station right there. There's a Pierre Marquette Depot that gives you a little bit of an idea of where you're at. This was like well, this is the Imperial Hotel right here. So this was taken likely from the county building, from one of the store, top stories on the county building, looking down. But this is the, the A and P right here. Yes. 
Where's the track that goes to Sagan office? It was on the other side of the building, went right through where that building is. Well, it's, uh, and it went along Jefferson. Yeah. Um, down to Koshetsko or whatever it is. Koshetsko, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the photo. Shoes. Yeah, you can't see it. You can't see it, no. It's gone. It took the, it must have taken the tracks out by that point then. I am going to move quick through some of these. I'm running a little bit behind here. Um, this was the H.G. Wenlinen Company, and uh, it started in 1891 on Washington Avenue between Center Avenue and Fifth. 1899, they built an addition on, and the news of the day said that this would give Bay Cityans their first department store, similar to those in larger cities. Of course, at that time, I guess 1899, we, weren't, we were on the outs as a large city at that point. When ready for occupancy, the firm will have one of the finest dry goods stores in the state. Every present department will be enlarged and the cloak department will be placed in the present annex on the ground floor. The store would also feature a carpet department, a curtain department, a drapery department, three other departments to be named later, an, ele an electric elevator, and an electric cash register system. So then uh, the other one, this was taken about 1938 and then later on, you see them down here, this was 1958. This is when that photograph was taken. And they were, there's an interior of a later edition. They were an anchor in the downtown for more than 70 years. And they uh, did a la their last large scale renovation in 1961. And that was two years after founder H.G. Wenlin had passed away. Now they renovated the interior and you see some of this, this is uh, the baby department and the interior. There were some photographs that came our way that show some of these other areas. And then in 1963, after a period of financial difficulty, the decision was made to close the store, and it was subsequently sold. <laughs> and then it burned, but that's, that's another story. The, the L.E. Oppenheim Company <laughs> operated, uh, it was L.E. Oppenheim Apparel Company, started in 1882, and they were for more than 50 years located in what was the Bay City Bank Building, came the Chemical Bank Building. Uh, before moving to the former site of the H.G. Wenland and Company on Washington Avenue in 1964. So Oppenheim's then, for many years, was a premier clothing sale place. Christmas Eve, for some reason we do these things in December, I, I don't know why. <laughs> Christmas Eve of 1979, police responded to an after-hours burglar alarm and they found the smoke and then of course it was, this was another fire that lots of people say, oh my dad took me down to see the fire. Okay, surrounding buildings, including the bank building to the south, were not severely damaged. However, Oppenheim's itself was a total loss, estimated at a million dollars in damages. And today, the site is still vacant. Another fire. We go to Easter time for this one. Um, this, was, uh, this was the Redato, which was right across the street. Uh, wait a minute, let me get my bearings. No, it was on our side of the street. It would have been basically... Pretty much right where we are, only toward the street a little ways. Um, it was an office building at the corner of Center and Madison. Of course, it wasn't right on the corner. It was just slightly off the corner. One of the finest uh, buildings built for that in, in Bay City. It had large storage and office rooms, condomi uh, uh, condominium, condominius, what do they call it? I don't know what. Con I'm sorry. <laughs> Stair large. That's stairways and elevators. I'm, I'm quoting in that. So immense public assembly hall on the third floor. It was designed by Dylan Prosser Clark, and it was des uh, who designed it in 1890. And he built it for Frank and Fremont Chesboro. And the Chesboro, one of the Chesboros, owned a house, one of the big houses on Center Avenue. It was featured as one of the largest halls in Michigan. It had accommodations for 500 people and a full orchestra. On top of that. And its many in, attendants over the years included the Aladdin Homes Company, the Bay City Business College, and the Bay City Business College was in session on April 1st, 1940, when fire broke out. Luckily, there was no loss of life, however, the building was a total loss. And it's actually the parking lot out here in front of the Ellison Jack Wirt Library. Large, large building. The county actually moved their um, the, the county actually moved their offices over there when they were between the two buildings I showed you. When they were building the present one, they moved their offices over because they had to tear the old building down. 
I'm sure everybody's been was in Mill End at one time or another. More world's most unusual store. Um, however, this building is the same building. This is the old. This at the time was um, was built. It's called the Shearer Block, but it's not the original. This is the original Shearer Block now. And it was built in 1867 at Sunder and Water, shortly after a devastating fire uh, raced through downtown. Lost a lot of buildings during that one. Now, this was across from the Fraser House, so this was a pretty good location right there. Um, it was a new brick building. It, it met the new building codes. And one long-standing tenant was jeweler John Rose. And John happened to welcome a young Herman Hiss into his business at one time. And Hiss was at the site. It was called Herman Hiss and Company. And it eventually moved then, of course, to Washington Avenue, where it is now, in 1910. Now, the Shearer Block is best known for the Mill End building. And you can still see, you know, all this cornice work at the top here, you can still kind of see where that was attached up at the top, but the building over the years deteriorated significantly. Now, the store was in there for 65 years. It was dubbed the world's most unusual store. They started in 1940 as a women's clothing store. And eventually they became pla the place to know known as the place to find almost anything. I bought a pair of cowboy boots back in the 1970s, I think, there. Um, and they purchased their inventory from bankruptcies and fire sales. Now, they closed in 2005, and they didn't burn, but they were, it was raised in 2012 to make way for the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the mill and lofts, which is paying homage to that site. Here's another building that would have been um, across the street and down a couple blocks. This was the... Uh, this was built by Algernon Munger and his brother Curtis, known as the, the Munger Block. Uh, for a while, it was a Victorian business block, essentially. Cook and Company uh, was in there for a long time. It was a dry goods store. Mason and Beach had a drugstore in there. But later, it became the Center Theater. They took all the, the supports out of, out of the inside of it to turn it into a movie theater. And if you can see, the, the, if hopefully it shows up well there. It does in the photograph. This whole thing has fallen in. A uh, local developer decided to try to turn it into condominiums at one time and not realizing that the <coughs> support beams had all been taken out and it was basically being held up by its own sheer um, determination, I guess, um, it fell down and then it had to be raised. And of course now there's a new, uh, it was, um, well there's a new restaurant built on that site now, brand new building. This is the, um, this was the depot located, this is one of our, um, <coughs> Another building with a tower, but it's the Jackson and Lansing, I'm sorry, Jackson, Lansing and Saginaw Railroad Depot became the Michigan Central Railroad in 1871, and they later became the New York Central. And this was the building uh, that was located over at fir uh, First and Jackson, and it was eventually torn down, and you can see the tower coming down here, but the only thing that's left is a baggage, there's a little baggage building that's around still over there. And I apologize, I'm going to have to move fast through this. Of course, everyone remembers when the bridge fell in. This is a, somebody took, took a snapshot of it and uh, gave it to us. This was 19, June, tw June 18th, 1976, and this, made, this was one of those other things that made uh, world news. And they even wrote a song about it. So. And here's a house. We know nothing about this house except that this is Center Avenue right here. Uh, this was, came out of a scrapbook of things from a guy named uh, Captain Ben Bautel. Some of these things we simply don't know, but this is such a cool photograph, I think. It's great. You got everything. You got people. You got transportation. You got brick streets. And you've got a house that we will hopefully identify at some point. This one is, uh, there's a chapter eight, deals with entertainment, recreation, and fun. This is, uh, look at the elephants, tail to, tail to trunk, all the way down Center Avenue. This is the port chair of the Winona Hotel. The guy standing over here has a WBCM microphone. They are actually uh, on the radio. He's announcing on the radio as this parade comes from the station, the, the train station, down to the parade grounds out east of town. Very interesting photograph. And you can see automobiles. So this is a fairly, you know, relatively speaking, in circus terms, this is a fairly recent photograph. Uh, 1932. This was taken out at the out at the park at the uh, fairgrounds. Um, Gonza wrote that in 1905. Augustus Gonza wrote that the Bay County Agricultural Society um, made acquired land and made a most desirable fairgrounds in a half mile track par excellence. He knew how to write, that's for sure. At the eastern limits of Bay City, just north of the eastern, or I'm sorry, just north of the 
eastern limits of, base, of Center Avenue. And with an easy reach of the, he calls it, oldest and most advanced townships. Um, the racetrack was made of wood and featured a two-story observation and timing tower. And these are photographs that show that racetrack in use. There's the observation and timing. Of course, all of this is now, it's part of the fairgrounds, but it's been definitely been improved. But this was a wooden, and you can actually see in the photographs here, there's several others in the book, you see the, um, uh, the wood that actually was the racetrack itself. And they used to hold races out there. These are probably national bicycle riders, which are Bay City built bicycles. We had a baseball park, our first official, or our official baseball park. Uh, it was on Center Avenue at the Eastern Limits. Earlier parks were not officially named. However, in 1909, Clarkson Park was posthumously dedicated to John G. Clarkson, whom you see this gentleman right here with the tape running through his face. Um, he, uh, he was a former National League pitcher from Bay City who played most notably with the Chicago White Stockings from 1884 to 1887 and the Boston Bean Eaters <laughs> from 1882 to 1894. He retired to a life of cigar manufacturing, another theme here, in Bay City after his National League days, but he still stayed active in promoting his former sport. This is a rare panoramic photograph of Clarkson Park. And it was taken around 1914 when the Bay City team at the right met with the Saginaw team at the left. And if you note the tall building in the background, that's the old chicory plant that would, this would have been, um, this is in that same general location as the old um, uh, Ray's, yeah, the old Ray's food fair on that side of the road at the eastern limits out by Essexville. Um, the park, <coughs> excuse me. That's the old chicory plant. Baycast would have been across is across the road now in that general vicinity as well. What the chicory plant do? They produce chicory uh, <laughs> products from chicory. They would uh, coffee substitutes and things like that. They were used as a coffee substitute. Some people still drink chicory as a drink. It, it's an interesting. But but we had our own our own ballpark. Um, this was I'm, I've got a few more slides and I know we're running over here a little bit, but. This is Westover's Opera House. This was known as the Bay City Opera House, built 1871, the corner, the southwest corner of Center, Washington and Center. This is where the Phoenix Building is now located. Um, because, unfortunately, well, here, here we, well, I'll show you a couple photos and then I'll tell you about, which it won't be a surprise, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, here's the Westover Opera House as well. This is looking down Center Avenue. Uh, you know, now we see park right here, but there were buildings along, along Water Street. Water Street, but here we see the, law, the tallest building in Bay City at that time, and this building, um, this was taken about 1875, and this would have been the landmark right here. This was the landmark corner, so the Phoenix Building sits on that site right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> it was still the tallest building in town when fire broke out on a cold January evening in 1886. And according to the Tribune writer, plumes of black smoke arose heavenward and in the breathless air they sent a feeling of sincere regret through all who witnessed them for the belief that the bold structure was doomed, uh, was doomed, was enter, I'm sorry, was doomed and entertained for, I'm sorry, I messed that one up. That the structure was doomed, that was entertained for all to listen to. The Opera House was a total loss. Professor William Wright, who had offices in the building, was one of the many who gathered to watch the fire, and he did a painting. I'm sure it's a little, little liberty taken, but uh, this was later given to the, this is huge. This thing is, is probably as big as, well, close to as big as a screen, except a little, not as quite as tall. Um, the painting was presented to the fire department, and Chief Harding then gave it to the Bay County Historical Society in 1848, and it's one in our collection. This is a black and white picture of it, but it shows, sorry, it shows. Have you gotten that painting out recently? No, it was on exhibit for quite a while. It is, it's massive. The problem is it's, it's hard to exhibit. Um, I'm sure we will in the future. This is the other opera house. This is Woods Opera House. This was um, built at, actually, while Westovers was still um, in the, was still an opera house. But this was built, um, 1881, and then uh, this was built as a second opera house, essentially. And uh, there, let me see, in Woods, uh, it opened in December, from the time it opened through December of 1899, there were over 100 performances of more than 60 different operas in this. 
Bohemian Girl, La Mascate, The Chimes of Normandy, uh, the Mikado and Olivet were just some of those that were there. Um, Woods in the in the spring of 1888, famous actor Edwin Booth, brother of John Wilkes, appeared in Julius Caesar in this building. Yeah. Was there an opera company? Not in, in ba not in Bay City. There wasn't that I know. So of. these were touring. Yeah, these were all touring groups, and they also hosted things like lectures. They hosted temperance lectures, all that kind of stuff at these places as well. Um, now the building, um, on. In a, on August 29th, uh, 1902, a fire started on the stage. Actors, were, when they were finished for the evening, it started after that. The flammable scenery, and soon the building was engulfed. This was, the in, this was what the interior of the building looked like. This is another T.E. Webster photo. But all of that became unstable and the building burned. And one man uh, was buried under the bricks as the roof collapsed. The building was a total loss. And that's where the Washington Theaters was built, on the, on the foundations of the old woods after it was. So if you remember the Washington Theater, which is now the drive through for Chemical Bank. Um, of course, other ones that we had, this is the uh, drop, drop screen, because they would put a, have a drop screen down. And we were able to figure out that this was the, the Regent, the drop screen of the Regent Theater, which is this theater. It was located in the Davidson Building. And the Regent's drop screen had local advertisers, I mean, that's how they, they probably paid for a lot of the stuff. It was, uh, um, we were able to figure that out because one of the things said opposite this building. We were able to figure out, kind of triangulate the whole thing. Um, but in 1918, the Regent was built, 1400 seat theater, and uh, had an eight piece orchestra and an organist. And in this particular photo, Bird at the South Pole, or with Bird at the South Pole is actually playing, around 1930. And the Regent staged drop curtain. Um, well, actually, you saw that. I'm sorry. That's the other. So then we go on to the final thing I'll deal with. And there's lots more uh, history on theaters and things like that in the book as well. How many people, I don't know, anybody from here go see Bob Seger at Summer Celebration? Okay, there's a few. Good. Um, this was a half of a ticket stub. I've not been able to find a full ticket stub, so I had to deal with a half a ticket stub from a friend of mine. Uh, the half, the, his half of the ticket stub for Bob Seger's celebration. Summer Celebration was a series of four major concerts given at Engel Stadium at Central High School's campus um, on Columbus Avenue. The concert was organized and sponsored by the, high, the Central High Booster Club. The first one was held in 1977 and it featured Ario Speedwagon, Brownsville Station, Firefall, and Salem Witchcraft. It drew 9,000 fans. 1978, veteran rocker, uh, Bob Seeger, with the Silver Bullet Band, headlined the concert and was supported by a relatively unknown Van Halen. And they also had local bands, including the band featured above, which is a band called Couture, which was out of Saginaw. Um, and attendance estimates for that concert were, um, which was held on night, August 19th, they were about 24,000 people strong. And many of them camped the night before through a torrential rainstorm until the gates opened at 11 o'clock and the first band did not go on until 4 o'clock. So they were there for a while. And in the bottom, uh, we see a picture that a friend of mine took of, of uh, David Lee Roth, the lead singer of then un relatively unknown Van Halen, uh, doing one of his signature moves where he jumped off of something in his mid, caught him in midair. And of course, here we see it's a little blurry, unfortunately, on the big screen. But here we see the, the people in Van Halen, including Roth and uh, Eddie Van Halen's in there, and you can see a little bit of the drummer Alex, and then um, uh, Michael Anthony, their bass player. So, like, uh, Indiana Jones was a boyhood hero of mine, Van Halen, when I was, I'm also a musician, so Van Halen originally was one of my idols as well. I didn't go to the concerts, unfortunately. I didn't make it to them. Now, in conclusion, after you learn the history of some of our lost history, you may even be able to go around town and pick out some remnants of our lost history or our lost stories that are hiding in plain sight. Take, for instance, this Terry Dickinson mural. You'd probably drive by it a lot. It's on the back of the H.P. Horak, F.P. Horak building, right on Saginaw Street. That was the original Sears building. Yes? commissioned the, uh, was it the individual store owners that had this person come in and do it? I believe so. I think that's how it worked. Um, and there's supposed to be 50 of these murals around town, and we haven't located. However, I was recently in the gymnasium at Bay City Western, and many times as I've looked at their warrior that they have painted on the wall, I didn't give it much thought. 
But my vantage point this particular time, I saw a partial signature hidden under a piece of conduit, and I'll be darned if it didn't say Terry McDermott. I'm sorry, Terry Dickinson. That's wrong, wrong, wrong one. I, I, Terry Dickinson, not McDermott. That's another story. Um, yeah, but no, it said Terry Dickinson. So we, we have Terry Dickinson murals hiding all over the place, it seems like. Um, so that's what I have. Thank you, everyone. If anyone has any questions.